YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry. So continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today's video is episode four of the uh, Extra History series on the 1918 flu pandemic. So we are entering, uh, so episode four, so we're now entering the second half of things here. And it's been fascinating. And uh, like I said in the intro of the other videos, I'm doing this for a timely reason because... Um, one thing that's cool about history is getting context and precedent of things in history that may happen today with the current um, pandemic going on. If you're watching this around the time I'm releasing it, um, this is kind of interesting thing to, to look at um, just to see what have global pandemics in the modern era looked like. Um, you know, not to say it's it's like comparing apples to apples. It can be apples to oranges, but, you know, it just can give some context a little bit in history. So um, I've really enjoyed kind of checking this out. Even if the current pandemic wasn't going on, I'd still think this was great, but it's just, it just seems to fit a little bit better. And again, I'm not trying to put out that these things are exactly the same or any kind of stance on that. Just trying to find something in history that maybe we can get some context on, right? Anyway, uh, so... Where things have kind of led up to at this point is um, the war is now ending and the allies are winning and both sides now have the flu. And where they kind of left off was uh, it's really now starting to spread within the American public and uh, elsewhere in the world, of course. I also talked about, too, how the Spanish king, uh, the king of Spain, got it and... Uh, the news media ended up calling it the Spanish flu once he got it, which is interesting because it doesn't seem to have originated there at all or anything like that. But that was interesting. But now they're talking about how it's going to start spreading, uh, which is pretty timely because it's like people are celebrating the end of the war and they're coming back to celebrate, gathering in large groups. And unfortunately, in these uh, mass meetings of joy is also going to bring death in a way. And that looks like what they're saying here with the first uh, frame here is September 28th. In Philadelphia. All right, we're going to get started, though. Okay, original video link is down below. Make sure you click it so you can give it a like and subscribe over there. And um, hope you enjoy it. Let's go ahead and get started. September 28th, Philadelphia. The Liberty Loan Parade is in full swing. Thousands march in the streets. Hundreds of thousands watch. Few know that health officials have pressured the mayor to cancel the event. Okay, you have got to for a bigger context, understand what a Liberty loan is. Um, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a bond. Um, what it basically says, cause it, it makes it a little bit more, more, uh, marketable that way. Uh, it's, it's a bond. Um, basically what that is, is you are giving a loan to your government. Um, the government was looking for money money and was looking for money from their citizens. And one way to get that is to sell war bonds. And again, it's like a loan, like you're going to pay it to the government and then, you know, hopefully, you, you know, you get that money back and they have to market it as such where it's like, you know, a loan, a liberty loan. Doesn't that sound very patriotic that you're supporting the war that way? And it's kind of fascinating that they're doing a, a liberty loan parade, they said in Philadelphia, which think of that as a big old advertisement to get people amped up to support the war and give give your money to support the war. Right. Um, and uh, that's that's underneath what's really happening here women wave flags a child sits on his father's shoulders the crowd falls silent for a simulated bombing run airplanes buzz overhead anti-aircraft guns fire blanks that'd into be the cool sky. to see actually the crowd next craned tries to imagine what it's like to be in mortal peril little do they know they already are in a different way right so it's like, hey, they're trying to like scare. What's war like? So the yeah, low flying uh, planes and stuff like that. World War One didn't use bombers, but low flying planes like that, and uh, big what artillery and stuff like that get them going and get them fearful about uh, the vi or the 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 uh, reality, harsh realities of war and potential death that comes from war. When that's a pretty good opening, but really they kind of are doing that because Philadelphia has become completely infected and it's starting to spread now. The flu was already burning in Philadelphia, but after the Liberty Loan Parade, it explodes. Three days later, the hospitals start to fill. With the war sapping medical professionals, there aren't enough doctors or nurses, and the hospital staff starts to die. Though colleagues fall around them, doctors and nurses stay at their posts. Some in private practice make 60 house calls a day. Over a thousand die that first week. 
That was in that first week in Philadelphia. And yeah, they said how, you know, those frontline people are those medical providers and they're putting themselves in the line and are often the ones to, to get it. Sad. And in three weeks, the death toll approaches 5,000. The dead quickly begin to overwhelm Philadelphia. Morticians post staff at hospitals to free up beds the moment victims expire. If a patient starts turning blue, nurses tag them for the morgue. It saves time. <laughs> But the morgue, oh, the morgue, that's where you put your dead. So they're like, hey, this person, they're turning blue. That might be the beginning of the end of them. Let's go ahead and tag them so when they die, you can immediately, boom, get them out of there. And then probably, what, reuse the bed, reuse the room and stuff like that. Um, today, hospitals are so much better and be able to, uh, to, to limit the spread of diseases in rooms. Like I heard about uh, rooms that don't recycle air from other rooms it'll come directly from outside uh they'll do that with contagious patients put them in those kind of rooms so that the air in one room cannot go to another room right and i wonder if they have anything close to that in the 19 teens i can't imagine they would is out of space and refuses to accept more bodies workers keep doors and windows open to dissipate the stench and fluid runs out the door and into the gutter the catholic church gets involved mobilizing clergy to help clear the backlog when the priests enter the morgue, they find 400 bodies. They're everywhere. Lying on desks and stacked in corners, the building is at 12 times its maximum capacity. Things are no better at graveyards. Pre-burial vaults are full. The city has run out of coffins and wood to build coffins. There's so many logistical things to think about. I, I, I had this conversation in my classes when I talk about the plague, like the Black Death of the 14th century. It's like, what do you do when half of your population is dead? Like, what do you do with that many dead bodies? And pay proper respects. You can throw them in these mass graves and stuff like that. And Yeah, just the logistics of it. And you can see what's the problem is happening here is, obviously our hospital system, you know, hospital systems at any time in history can't afford to have that many people at once. So it's impossible to do that. So you start, like they're saying, go out, get get the uh, other part, other locals involved, like, get churches involved. That was a big thing in the Black Death, by the way. The church was kind of the first responders. Um, remember, the in, in, in the Middle Ages, oftentimes priests and nuns were also the, hair, the health care givers and were often the first ones to get the disease and contract it, which was very confusing to people in the Middle Ages that the righteous servants of God were contracting this disease at such a high rate, um, which made him question a lot of things, you know. People use wheelbarrows and potato sacks to bring loved ones to the cemetery, then leave them there. Once again, the Just church hoping they get buried. In, hiring a construction crew to dig trenches with steam shovels. They stack the coffins too deep while recording exactly where each person is buried. At night, citizens hear them reciting Latin prayers over the mass grave. But that took time to organize. And for weeks, thousands are not buried at all. With hospitals, morgues, and cemeteries refusing to accept corpses, people have to live with the dead in their homes. And many families are so ill that they can't move a corpse at all and simply sleep, eat, and live next to the deceased. Weeks in, Philadelphia leaders finally... <laughs> no one can accept the dead bodies, so they're just... Granddad, whatever it is, is... Just there in your house, dead, rotting away. Gonna make this thing even worse, right? Look, I, I know, hard to imagine that, right? Rent a warehouse as an overflow morgue. Organized teams of policemen and priests circle the city, collecting the dead in horse-drawn carts. Philadelphia would be the worst hit city in America, with half a million cases. By the end of October, the city government almost ceased to function, and private citizens stepped in to run the response. People volunteered cars as ambulances and worked as dispatchers at medical phone banks, a primitive 911. But just up the coast, it was a different story. While the head of New York's Board of Health had been slow to respond, the Remember that guy that they talked about in the last one? The New York Board of Health guy had no like scientific background at all. And I don't know how you get your job and be some appointing or something like that. Um, yeah, it was anyway. a different story. While the head of New York's Board of Health had been slow to respond, the city had experience fighting epidemics like polio and tuberculosis. The Public Health Service had a major presence and experience screening and quarantining people at the Port of New York. In fact, that's what happens too with uh, during the Industrial Revolution when urbanization gets out of control 
and they were unable to keep up with sewage and sanitary conditions during the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Big cities like New York had to deal with things like cholera, which were horrifying diseases. So uh, you hope that by this time, by the 19 teens, the, the, the public health I know, infrastructure is a lot stronger than what it had been. Hopefully the last, it should have been the last 30 years having things like this that hopefully would have changed policies. The port had started quarantining ships the moment reports of the flu arose on the Western Front, but the war made full quarantine impossible. The city instituted laws criminalizing spitters and people who failed to cover their mouths when they coughed or sneezed. <laughs> they posted notices urging the sick to stay home under voluntary quarantine, report illnesses to a doctor, and they called for people to wear gauze masks. So, obviously, seeing some similar things. One of the things I was most interested in finding out in this series is what kind of legislation and, and health laws or whatever um, were coming in and hopefully what effect did they have? But yeah, how did they do it? And what was the timeline like, right? Uh, how how many, how, how far had the disease spread before these laws were, were put in place? And how, maybe how that can compare to today and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of similar things there. Quarantine, report illnesses, go over your face, right? Seeing all that, of course, right now. The Board of Health surveyed neighborhoods to track the spread. They set up medical centers that dispatched doctors and nurses on house calls. And most importantly, they convinced businesses to stagger working hours and shopping times, reducing crowds on public transit. Makes sense. I mean, sensible things that you see, you don't, you want to limit as much as possible. Yeah, the amount of people close contact. You've seen that today a little bit. Um, but that kind of doing the opposite now. A lot of what a lot of places are doing now is actually reducing hours um, rather than, well, they didn't really say in here they're, ex well, kind of. Wait, let's go back. I want to get that timeline again. Do they say they were extending hours to try to stagger populations? Let's go back like 15 seconds. Oz masks. The Board of Health surveyed neighborhoods to track the spread. They set up medical centers that dispatched doctors and nurses on house calls. And most importantly, they convinced businesses to stagger working hours and shopping times, reducing crowds on public transit. But even in New York... Okay, the okay. So yeah, they kind of are staggering the time, staggering the shift. So limit the amount of people that are around at one time. You don't really see that as much right now with what they're doing, huh? Press continued to minimize the outbreak in order to protect morale. And it was the same in cities and towns across America, even as the disease spread west. Newspapers would claim there was nothing to worry about one day, and then the next announced that all public gathering places were closed. It'd be confusing, right, to see that. The result was uncertainty and fear. Everyone knew newspapers were covering it up. People could see the obituaries. They saw the Red Cross ads begging for nurses. Families tracked the flu coming down the rail line or highway via letters and articles buried in the back pages. It was in the next state, the next county, the next town, and finally next door. So you wonder then, because it sounds like the, the, the media is downplaying it. When a big criticism today is the people saying that the media is... Um, blowing it up it's actually doing the opposite thing right because i mean when it comes to media the, the the more interesting the story is the more people are going to want to learn about it and read the stuff right it's, it's the headline headline news right so i wonder if that is significant in a way of telling how media covers things um, over the last 100 years right so covering something up because usually when you think about media, they're trying to uncover things, not cover things, uncover things to be on the cutting edge of the new thing. Be something that people are going to want to read as opposed to your competitor. So a lot of people, you know, talk about the media with that way. So I wonder if that's interesting of indicative of the way, yeah, the media covers things maybe now again versus 100 years ago. In this climate of mistrust, rumors grew. One conspiracy theory claimed the flu was a bioweapon released from German U-boats off the Atlantic <laughs> coast. Another said that the German-owned Bayer Corporation had poisoned its aspirin with the disease. A rumor ran around Phoenix that dogs carried the disease, and as a result, Arizonians killed thousands of strays and pets. And Please, 07s. For the Arizona pets. 
Moment of silence. And in San Francisco, a policeman shot a man who refused to comply with new flu mask laws. Evangelist Billy Sunday. Um, real quick, the something they talked about a couple times ago is saying it was a weapon from the enemy. Isn't that interesting how you usually find that if something's... Everyone, when, when, when disasters happen like this, there's always a group or, or something that tries to say whoever it is your enemy is, is responsible for it. You see that all the time. Like whoever is you don't like, you pin it on them. Like immediately. A lot of people like, it seems like, like to go to that uh, quickly. Claimed the disease was a punishment visited upon a sinful nation and held a mass prayer meeting to end the epidemic. Of course, you're going to have, you know, the, the religious groups, people are going to turn to religious groups. People were doing that in the, uh, in, during the black death. Um, people were trying to consult their churches, their, 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 uh, this is in the 1300s. So it was, you know, for Europe, it was the, the Catholic church, but going to their priests and stuff like that for answers. A lot of them provided what they thought were answers. Some of them thought, yeah, it was a scourge among, uh, a scourge from God to get people to repent and to eliminate sinners. But then I know for a lot of people in, in Western Europe, they became confusing because like I said earlier in the video today, uh, some of the people that died in the highest percentages were, um, clergy because they were often visiting these people that were sick the monks um, nuns priests etc were dying in those high numbers and you know why would god be punishing them rather than the angry drunk that beats his children in the town you know what i mean that that guy survives but hey father whatever he lives and he seems to be you know the servant of god and you can be accusing so people are going to go to you know historically now we're seeing it whether it's 19 uh, 1918 or it's 1334 like people are going to where they believe answers can come from several in the crowd collapsed the flu while praying for deliverance whole wait, wait, what? punishment visited upon a sinful nation and held a mass prayer meeting to end the epidemic several in the crowd collapsed the flu while praying for deliverance <laughs> Some of them literally are collapsing from ailing from the flu while praying to be rid of it. Crazy, huh? Old towns isolated themselves, hiring armed guards. The flu got in anyway, arriving with mailmen and milk trucks. Shops began <laughs> yeah. asking customers to shout their orders, then leave the money on the doorstep. The hey, you kind of see that today. Uh, I was going to get some food and... You know, I had to pay online and then they brought it out to my car, but then like hand it to me. They put it on the hood of my car. And then when they walk away, I had to go and get my food from the hood of the car. Like, you see that stuff here today. By the way, again, this this series, if you didn't know, if you didn't see the date, this was um, 2018. They, it looks like they were doing a 100-year anniversary thing. So this was before the uh, current COVID uh, um, pandemic. But it's fascinating to see similarities, right? The owner would take the money and leave the goods. Children distilled this paranoia into a jump rope rhyme. One that captured the sense of an unwanted visitor invading the home. I had a little bird and her name was Enza. I opened up the window and in flew Enza. <laughs> the country needs something. Dude, this is like a sick, sick rap. We're dropping bars here. Let's let's do it again. The home. I had a little bird and her name was Enza. I opened up the window and in flew Enza. The country needs something. That was actually pretty dumb. <laughs> to stop this nightmare. At the Rockefeller Institute, they isolate Pfeiffer's bacillus in mid-October, and the Army Medical School begins the process oh, yeah. of injecting it into horses, drawing their blood, and isolating the antibodies for a vaccine. Yeah, didn't they say something about horses were like immune to it, and they were trying to use, I know they were testing with horses to try to find immunization things and stuff like that. But. By October 25th, the vaccine is ready. Express trains rush deliveries to the West Coast to protect troops and shipbuilders there. They've made enough to vaccinate the entire U.S. Army and its civilian employees, but only enough for the Army. For the duration of the war... Yeah, how do you make 100 million of them or whatever? You know what I mean? That's that's crazy. And it already brought my mind, you know, going back to, like, the, the Black Death, something we always refer to there, the, the plague of the 14th century in Europe, how things like immunizations were not a thing. So diseases like this just ran their course which again makes you think although they said it just for here it only hit the military um how worse the numbers could have been the rockefeller institute was a military organization and therefore their work focused on the military no matter how much mayors and governors begged for vaccine they wouldn't receive a single vial it took a parallel civilian effort to provide yeah. relief to the public it seems like this would have to come from the private medical industry 
for this to happen. And there's so much incentive to do it. I know that's happening now. People are working hard because obviously whoever can develop it, it's going to make some good money if you can develop something like this. So the, the private sector, you know, um, will do that because there's financial incentive too and, and moral incentive, of course. At the New York Hygienic Lab, Williams labors over lung samples from hospitals and orphanages, trying to find whether Pfeiffer's exists in a majority of victims. And she finds it everywhere. She isolates a sample and proves antibodies can bind to it, further confirming it was the culprit. That done, she cultures vast quantities of Pfeiffer's, leader upon leader, then hands them off to Park, who rushes upstate to mass-produce vaccine at his farm. Deep down, researchers knew this was not good science. The process had been too fast. Did no one enough. really knew whether Pfeiffer's caused the flu. And if, as some suspected, the culprit was a virus invisible to microscopes, these vaccines... That, yeah, they said that earlier that they it might have been something because um, they couldn't identify it. Was it. Didn't they say that some people that were ailing, ailing of it, they couldn't find the strain like in there? So is it even smaller? Um, now, one thing that's very different from what I understand about the medical industry now is, uh, and, and back then is there are so much, so many more processes you have to go through to get a vaccine legal or whatever, you know, and, and that has a good, good, good place. Not just, otherwise you're going to get just these fake miracle cures that are going to go out there and you're going to swindle people. It's got to go through a series of tests. But again, it's like, you don't want to be too slow because, you know, every day people are dying. But then at the same time, you got to make sure that this is legit. So I think that'd be another thing that would uh, be very hard to make informed decisions on in a timely manner. Would do nothing. It was I risk whether Pfeiffer's caused the flu. And if, as some suspected, the culprit was a virus invisible to microscopes, these vaccines would do nothing. It was, one researcher said, like fighting a ghost. Still, it was worth trying there was a possibility they'd accidentally snare the disease-causing agent in their sample, and the horses would make antibodies for it. That was how the first rabies vaccine happened, after all. In fact, one Rockefeller researcher counted on this, producing a vaccine that contained antibodies for every bacteria he could find, yeah. all mixed together, yeah. hoping that one would stop the disease. Yeah. Just to do, put everything in there and hope one of them sticks. Cure all. Even as they rolled out the vaccine, Surgeon General Gorgas cautioned it was experimental, and no one knew if it would work. And it didn't. Labs oh. across the country produced dozens of vaccines, and none of them prevented flu. Remember in the other video, they said that things like this, strains like this, they're constantly evolving. And it's hard to keep up with it, because by the time you may, I mean, maybe this, what they're making here could have worked at the very beginning... But these these diseases, the virus and stuff, they, they change. They change all the time. They're always evolving because of how fast they, they produce. And uh, you have to, it, it almost seems like you have to get ahead of it. Like, get ahead of its evolution. Which, ugh, I don't know how you do that. Again, eh, ask a biologist. Because flu was, as some feared, an invisible virus. Yet despite that failure, medical science was not helpless. They could do little for patients killed directly by the, the flu, train. the ones that turned blue, but they could fight the opportunistic pneumonias that followed it. Okay. The anti-pneumonia vaccine and serum Avery had worked on during the earlier measles epidemic was effective and likely saved some people. Thousands of troops took it on the surgical. So, I mean, it sounds like you can die from you know, like one of the things you can die from a lot of ways. One of the things that you can die from is pneumonia from this. Um, so that's good that they have something there, but it sounds like, again, you can die in a lot of different ways. Side, doctors developed a new procedure to enter the lungs and drain the sacs of pus that drowned patients. Others used oxygen, x-rays, and cardiac stimulants Pop a to hole support in your lung. ailing victims. But nurses provided the most valuable care. There were too few doctors, too many patients, not enough medicine, and what treatments they had often took too long to administer en masse. Nurses, on the other hand, could keep patients hydrated, warm, and breathing comfortably. They could ease coughs and lower temperatures. And that kind of long-term care probably affected a patient's survival more than anything a doctor could do in the few minutes they had at each bedside. Added to that, the Red Cross developed a system that predicted the flu's cycle of infection, when it would die down in one area and spring up in another, letting them deploy emergency teams of nurses before they were needed. But as everyone from city officials and the Red Cross responded to the crisis, there was one man who refused to do anything. 
President Wilson. Oh! When briefed about- Oh! President Wilson! What are you doing, man? About the deadly influenza outbreak, the one question on his mind was whether he should order the troop ships to continue ferrying soldiers to France. He did, and the flu kept killing. Again, talk about a hard thing to deal with. President Wilson's an interesting character because he was um, against entering the war for a long time. Uh, when he won his re-election, uh, it was right during the war, and was campaigning on keeping America out of the war because that's that's what people wanted. It's before you know the, the summation of the events that led to America getting involved in the war. So yeah, I was interested to see what. Because everything they've been talking about has mostly been on the public level for, for like legislation, rules, and stuff. But yeah, I've been interested to see what um, the federal government is going to do about it and from, from him himself. But again, man, how hard is it to, to deal with that? It's one thing you know, if the totally, they're not totally worrying about right now is having something like a world war to deal with at the same time of trying to protect your citizens because they're, they're inseparable in a way, right? They're very much connected. So, yeah, I'm interested to see more. I'm, I'm assuming episode five is going to maybe talk more about federal response and President Wilson's response. Because I think that'll be interesting to see is what what is the top down intervention in this pandemic going to look like? Um, and again, with the added the added difficulty of uh, having to deal with World War One at the same time. So, all right. OK, good episode. I uh, learned a lot today. I was really this was this was one of the ones I was really looking forward to as far as content goes, because I really wanted to see what uh what the societal reaction was and what types of things were going in to prevent it so it's you know about the quarantines and the face masks and the public gatherings and all that just so we can get some context and some connection to uh what's going on so um that was that was really interesting to see there and also see the medical response of them trying to make stuff but apparently they went out too quick you know like they were saying because it didn't work and um, so that's been interesting to see too you know, awesome. I think everybody should be watching this. Um, share this Share this 1918 flu pandemic or maybe anything you can find on the 1918 uh, flu. There's a lot of stuff I've just seen on the inter on, on YouTube and stuff here. Make sure they're, you know, good channels and stuff. But uh, I think it's really important that people get educated on this, don't you? I mean, uh, just, to, just to have some context. And again, it's not apples to apples, you know, the today and, and then but i mean there there are uh, some things that that were kind of interesting just to just to do a little compare and contrast no no harm in ever doing that if anything it's always beneficial in some way as long as you can process it the right way right okay with that i think we're good so look out for episode five this is a six part so we got two more left so keep an eye out for that best way to do that is make sure you're subbed and enable those notifications so you know when the um, videos come out and you can watch them right away and that'd be awesome okay again uh, original video link is down below make sure you click that um, some other things if you'd like to support the channel thank you to patron pledgers who had been actually uh, recommending this video for a long time um, one of the member one of the patron benefits if you join is you get a vote in polls and uh, get get videos help get videos uh, featured in that way so thank you to all of you that have been doing that and uh, with that yeah um, thanks again for being here links to things like discord and stuff in the description as well and uh, thanks for being here and being a part of history education on the internet see you next time bye